Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Pete Candler. I'm a writer and photographer at A Deeper South, a storytelling project in word and image about memory and amnesia in the American South. The vision of A Deeper South is rooted in the idea that the spiritual, political, and cultural health of a nation, region, city, town, or person depends upon an honest and unflinching memory that the gravest danger to our cities and ourselves is a willful amnesia, that hope is to be found through the work of active remembrance, putting back together the fragments of personhood scattered by a culture of selective memory. At A Deeper South, we try to begin the work of active remembrance through photography, storytelling, and documentary film. Our focus has been specific to the South's history but I believe this work is relevant to the nation as a whole. This unprecedented summer, under the combined conditions of a global pandemic and a global movement against systemic racism in our national cultures, A Deeper South has been hosting a series of live events aimed at reassembling some of those fragments of our broken histories, unlearning the falsehoods inherent in received narratives of this region's and nation's history, and restoring to their rightful place in our collective imagination of the past, the stories that we hid from ourselves. I am so delighted to welcome today two women to American Treasures, whose work is also concerned with restoring memory, to telling stories and writing songs that come out of the past, on the way to a new future. Roseanne Cash is a singer-songwriter, writer of fiction, native of Memphis, and now longtime resident of New York City. She is the recent recipient of the McDowell Medal for her outstanding contribution to American culture and the arts. Natalie Channon is a businesswoman, writer, and according to the New York Times, probably the greenest fashion designer there is. Natalie runs Alabama Channon, a seed to shelf lifestyle company based in her hometown of Florence, Alabama, in the heart of that state's most storied musical region. I am so excited to have both of you here today. I've been looking forward to this for a long time and uh, it's so great to have you both in the same room. Thanks so much for being here. It's a delight. To see both of you, my friends, yes. who I don't see very often. <laughs> Especially now. Yeah. One of the beautiful things about this whole Zoom world is that we get to be <clears throat> in the same room together, virtually at least, and it probably, you know, there are a lot of things would have to go the right way for us to do that in person. But um, I'm really grateful that we have this chance to be together. I want to start with a particular song uh, that I'm sure you both um, have been thinking of. And it's from, Roseanne, it's from your 2014 album, The River and the Thread. And it's a song that is about both of you. And it's been on replay for me for the last several weeks. And in fact, my five-year-old the other day, I overheard him saying, Alexa, play a feather's not a bird. <laughs> so, um, but I wanted to start with this song because it's about, you know, it, it is about both of you in a way. And it's also about um, the backstory of this is something that both of you have in common, which is a return to the South. Natalie, you grew up in Florence, but spent a long, a long time in New York City and around the world, and in North Carolina too, if I re remember correctly. And Roseanne, you grew up in Memphis, but... No, I grew up in California, I mean, though. Yeah born in Memphis, but grew up in California, excuse me. Yeah. And then have, you've obviously traveled the world too. Um, but in 2014, or at least 
leading up to that album, you took a trip with your husband and uh, collaborator, John Leventhal, to the Southeast. There was a, as I um, understand it, the genesis of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was more than one trip. It was several trips. And um, it start, this whole cycle started because um, Arkansas State University had purchased my dad's boyhood home about an hour from Memphis in Arkansas and wanted to restore it as a heritage site. And in fact, it became a national heritage site. So that started a lot of um, trips down south because I was involved with the university to help them raise funds to do this. And Natalie and I were friends and I stopped on one of those trips in Florence, John and I did to see her in Florence, Alabama. And um, she taught me to sew. <laughs> and uh, she was threading my needle and she just said this beautiful thing. She said, you have to love the thread. And she was threading my needle. And I don't know why, but I started to cry when she said that. I welled up. And of course the metaphor, you know, resonated profoundly to me that there I was in the South retracing my own, own birthplace and the steps of my ancestors and where they came from. And, you know, I hadn't thought about it in that way. You have to love the thread, the thread that goes into the past and the future. And even the thread you have to cut at some point, you have to love them before you can cut them or realize them anyway. And then she took me to the magic wall outside of Florence, um, which I will let her explain to you what the wall is. It's a little complicated story. So the magic wall is in the song and it's, you know, it's center, the center, central theme of it is loving the thread and this urgent journey through the South to find where the threads exist, even the ones that aren't part of my own ancestry, the music of Muscle Shoals and of the Delta. And um, I would have never written the lyrics to that song. John wrote the music. I would have never written them without Natalie. I mean, she was, she infused it with this meaning, or at least she set me off to find the meaning of those lyrics. Can I just, it, for those who maybe haven't heard the song, if there are any. And then the song won a Grammy. Sorry? But, no, I said then the song won a Grammy, so. Two, <laughs> two Grammys. Yeah. Well, the, the album won three Grammys, but that song won its own. Wait, you're right. That song won two of the Grammys, didn't it? Best, yeah. best, uh, Ameri is it Americana category? Best yeah, American yeah. Roots performance and yeah. best American yeah. Roots song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I'm correct about this, when you received the reward, you were wearing Alabama uh, Channon. Of course. Of course. <laughs> I'm wearing it right now. You're wearing it right but, now. Yeah, for the Grammys, I, she made me this gorgeous jacket uh, somewhere. You should show a picture of it. <laughs> so we weren't friends for very long when that happened, Natalie, were we? I mean, we hadn't known I, each other. I was before. trying to trace it back. You know, I, it's um, our friendship. I always feel like I've known Rose my whole life. It's one of those when you first see someone, you it's like, oh, hi, I remember you. <laughs> um, that was 2014. We had um, met maybe a couple years before that. Yeah, maybe. I think so. For a yeah. few years, we had a mutual friend, Ann Tenenbaum, and Ann kept saying to me for years before yeah. I met her, me she said, you have to meet Natalie Channon. You two are the same person. That's what she kept saying. <laughs> I felt like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember distinctly the first time she mentioned you, you know, and just every time I saw her, you have to meet Rose, you have to meet Rose. So. I used to go to uh, Barney's where 
Barney's used to carry Alabama Shannon, and I would go in long before I met Natalie and just finger the clothes. Just I wanted to touch them. I'd go down the rack and touch every one. They had a almost a mysticism to them. <laughs> so sweet. No, it's true. I had that same experience when I got to visit the factory last summer um, in Florence and those just shelves and shelves of spools of thread mm -hmm. um, and the colors themselves um, were were just kind of mesmerizing and I didn't touch any of the clothes because I felt like it was almost like <laughs> You sacred have. object. Um, <laughs> but can I just read a couple of lines from that song? Because if sure. anyone isn't familiar with it, I won't sing them. But the the song opens with it's John playing the guitar, if I'm correct. Yeah, of course. And so John yeah. plays this this kind of gritty electric guitar a slide guitar opening to it and so immediately you know immediately from the very beginning this is the first song on the record so immediately from the top you know where you are you know like yeah, of course you know exactly where you are kind of musically regionally and it begins like this i'm going down to florence gonna wear a pretty dress I'll sit on top the magic wall with the voices in my head. Then we'll drive on through to Memphis, past the strongest shores and on to Arkansas. Shoals, Shoals excuse me, Shoals. Yeah. And, and on to Arkansas just to touch the gumbo soul. There's well, a lot. Strongest yeah. Shoals, Shoals is a reference to muscle Shoals. And uh, the gumbo soul is a reference to the gumbo soil of Arkansas because that's what they call that, the soil in that area of the Delta where my dad grew up because it was so sticky mm. and thick. So of course I changed it to gumbo soul. I love that line. And I, I mean, you've got a lot going on in four lines of song <laughs> there. I mean, the- Well, and the pretty dress was, you know, something Natalie made. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the two of you are in this, you know, you're sure. in this first line of this song. And, yeah. and the, um, and it, that kind of refrain comes up again. I'm going down to Florence just to learn to love a friend. To um, love the thread. The thread. Yeah, you know, those damn lyric sites. I, I wish I could go through and vet and correct everything. <laughs> well, that's what I had heard, the thread, and then I, yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Forgive me, but to learn but to now, love. Now go ahead. I, I was just gonna say Natalie's mission was incredibly inspiring to me, you know, and that she gave me that line and um but that her whole mission in life is so beautiful and profound and she should tell you about that no oh. yeah so natalie what what is the thread for you what is this um what does that hold for you what kind of power does that material object possess that attracts you? Well, I mean, you know, it's really what holds all of our work together. I mean, it is the thing that literally ties all the fabric um, together. But, you know, this metaphor that um, Rose mentioned about learning to love the thread, it's, it's something that when I first started working in this way, because of the way thread is manufactured, it, um, you know, if you've ever tried to sew in a button or hem a pair of pants, how the thread will twist or not, you know, and so when you, when you love the thread, it kind of releases all the tension that comes from the manufacturing process. And so it makes the thread um, move through the fabric in a more, you know, through the path 
path of least resistance. And so we've used that a lot to, um, you know, just to think about smoothing out the thread, smoothing out the fabric, smoothing out life, smoothing out your own brain, um, you know, bringing it to kind of to a place of peace. And mm -hmm. I guess that's one of the things that, you know, very early in the company, we tried to sew in that way and of course continue in that way today so and so you, uh, it's bigger than that you know i mean the the whole mission of handmade and um doing things with your hands and the, the organic cotton and just everything she does american made the dyes everything is so thoughtful and i'm and this to me this is one of the things that really I feel like there's a real affinity in what both of you do because you both are working with um, traditions of music or of uh, sewing, making fabrics. You know, these things are as old as humanity practically. And um, there's also a motive too, like of carrying on that tradition um, of being a part of it, working within it, but also, as you said, Rose, kind of cutting the thread when that becomes necessary. But also, you know, the, I'd love to hear both of you reflect on this about the, the way it, working within a tradition can be both a kind of source of innovation and imagination. Um, and also it can, it can be a, an impediment, maybe. Does that make sense? Um, sure, totally. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll go first and be succinct because uh, I wanna hear what Natalie says about this. But working in a tradition, I, all, I teach songwriting sometimes and a lot of times young people will come in and, and they won't know the tradition they're writing in. They'll be writing, say, in a folk tradition, and I say, well, do you know this person, this person, this person? And they say, no, you know, I'm mostly paying attention to my own stuff. And I don't have any respect for that. If you don't know the tradition you're working in, then you're not grounded in any kind of reality or, or depth. And um, I found that for myself, obviously, at the same time, you're going to bring your own personality to it and your own character and filter it through your own life. And that's what gives it a sense of originality. But if it's based in the tradition, then that's what you start with, you build on. And you're right, when you're beginning, it can be an impediment because you're copying, you know, until you get your wings and can um, refer without plagiarizing. <laughs> yeah. Or even if you want to plagiarize. I plagiarize Shakespeare all the time. <laughs> I, I love, I, I first knew Rose through her book Composed. It's one of my all-time favorite books. And I always think about your, um, the way you write and the things that you do. It is more like composing, like taking all these different instruments and different histories and all these things and weaving them together like a like an orchestra I always find that so your work is so rich and deep and has so many different aspects I don't really know how you do that you yes you do to, you find this way to bring all this magic together it's incredible you absolutely know how to do that you do that. I mean, she came from back from Europe, you know, after living there for a decade, right? And and went back to Florence and put in, and that was after NAFTA, after all of the t-shirt factories had closed. And she put an ad in the paper, Seamstresses Want It, right? Well, I'm just to get back to you, not to, because um, you keep turning it back to me, but if, if you, you know, people, I'm always um, surprised people talk so much more about your music than your books. And I find your, your books I always, you know, I, I normally introduce, this is my friend Rose, the writer, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I, 
I think your books are so great and, and very seldom talked about in the grander scheme of all your beautiful music. So. Thank you. Having, I'm, I'm writing a uh, sequel to Compose called Decomposed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you if anyone's listening and hasn't read it it's it's such a beautiful read I, I i remember the moment i was reading it i i had been traveling to berlin and i was um in the airport on the way back i think i've told you this story rose but it was just so beautiful it made me cry not from sadness or anything just this great beauty of it and i mean i was sobbing in the airport and everybody around me was looking at me not i couldn't stop it was just like <laughs> like i had to devour it it was it was beautiful i'll never forget that moment but I was so excited when we finally became friends afterwards, but I, I do think about that moment a lot. It's it's such a beautiful book. Thank so. you. So it, Pete, you were down in the factory, right? I was, yeah. I mean, that that the factory, she calls it the factory, but it's really like a, a giant art installation, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it, it's 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 like a it's like a gallery um factory cafe i mean talk about kind of doing all these things this sort of variety of uh activities all in one space i felt like i was in kind of it was almost like a a temple or something i mean it was <laughs> it was um the the way everything is just organized um the the th I've mentioned the thread, but like the, the I'm not going to get the technical reams of fabric. Is that the right word? The just rolls and rolls of different types of fabric and the 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 names for all of these. There, there's there's like a yeah. We've we used this word a couple of times. A mystical quality to to them. She has yeah. She has names for all of the different patterns. What is this one called again? A uh, palm or palma. We call it. It's it's inspired by a palm tree or palm fronds. Right. Yeah. And it has these great um, trees. <laughs> this was a big to kind of my uh, PR person, right? I know. This, this, is, this is a new kind of sleep for you in the last year, though. It is. It yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad you both have come there. You know, we're so out of the way. So it's nice when people get to come through and see. But I think one of the things that maybe is so shocking for everybody and what you guys feel is magical or mystical is that, you know, we stopped many, many years ago devalue, devaluing the act of making you know like being in a factory being around things that were being made my my friend kathy from heath calls it um the hum of making and so i think we're um in society today we're so far uh, removed from this act of making that when you see it when you see all the materials when you see all these things coming together it it feels so um visceral like a part of because i do believe that you know in man as maker or man and woman as maker and so i think that a lot of people feel this visceral connection to it because you can see it touch it feel it you know yeah and we started a sewing circle um <laughs> in natalie's honor you know uh six six women here and uh, New York, and we met every couple of weeks, every three weeks, depending on where everybody was. And uh, we sewed, you know, Natalie also sells these kits so you can sew them yourself. So we, we're all sewing Alabama Channing kits. It was so much fun. They are a fun group. <laughs> well, that's something else that I, you know, I feel like maybe this is a, a stretch but it seems when we were talking about working in a tradition you know tradition is backward looking and a lot of times it becomes for for many people exclusively backward looking in a kind of traditionalist sense in other words like you only do things the way they were done exactly um a hundred years ago or whatever but there's a forward-looking um 
gesture, I think, in, in what both of you do. And Natalie, in your case, you know, I have this book right here, The, the Geometry of Hand Sewing, <laughs> which I love. And I mean, I got my kids into as well. And it's That's a very, um, and I should say, you're a, a terrific writer as well. And um, you deserve uh, a lot of credit for writing a, a book that's not just practically um, very useful, but really eloquent about the, this art form. Mm, thank and you. I also love the fact that you begin with this book. <laughs> yeah, or, the dot and the line. The dot and the line. Norton Juster, who wrote, most people know him from the Phantom Toll Booth, but he wrote this beautiful little book about a romance in lower mathematics. That's, that's such a great subtitle. But you talk about not only the dot and the line, but Euclid <laughs> and an introduction to a book about sewing, which yeah. is pretty extraordinary. I don't, I get, I confess I've not read a lot of books about sewing, but <laughs> I certainly don't encounter those two put together um, in any other context. So she you... also writes this blog on the Alabama Channel site that is so beautiful. One of her recent blogs was about her childhood and about integration and segregation. And as a child thinking that it was integrated right but then going yeah I, in my mind it was but the our school yearbooks tell a completely different story yeah so interesting. yeah no yeah but she is a beautiful writer too thank you both um yeah you know i was we've been teaching workshops and teaching sewing um like with rose for you know over a decade now and and I, my mother was a math teacher and, um, you know, I've never been really great at math, but I really understood geometry very well. And so i am always felt a real affinity to, to geometry. And as I was teaching these stitches, it occurred to me that, you know, it's really just a whole series of geome geometrical patterns. And if you could divide these all of these stitches up into geometrical patterns that it's almost like paint by number and would be like teaching kids to handwrite you know you just have these three parallel lines and they all um all of these points have a relationship to one another and when you look at it that way it's just it's very very simple to learn to do any kind of elaborate stitch and so that book is based on this, just these geometrical connections between points and lines. So it makes but, it really easy. <laughs> and in the Norton Juster book, that connection that you're talking about is actually a form of love. Like yes, that, exactly. The love between the dot and the line. E exactly. And how they make um, uh, yeah. sort of chaos I'm out of writing that down, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's such a sweet book. My, my, I mean, I, my mother gave it to me as a child. I knew that book and not the Phantom Toll Booth. It was not until my son was born that I got a little older that I knew the Phantom Toll Booth. But um, those are great books too. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a lot to sort of tease out of that image, like thinking about not just sewing. Um, but also music and, and storytelling, photography, whatever, that this relationship between the materials is one of love. Um, it helped me to say about your writing and your filmmaking and your photography. I mean, even if it's just it's so difficult and painful, the way you write with love about those things is so beautiful. Oh, that story about the church ladies Thank and you. the desserts. Oh. Mm -hmm. What was yeah. that called? Easter? Um, the, the, well, the last of the Easter ham, yeah. Oh, yeah, I love that. It was its first. I, I do have a soft spot for old church ladies. <laughs> Even the most terrifying ones. Even, especially the ones with hats. Especially the ones with hats, yeah. 
Well, thank you. I mean, I, I'm, thank you. Um, I, it's this, uh, this uh, helped me think too, this, this image of the dot and the line or the, the thread and the, the fabric or the, um, I'm not sure how, you, how in your work, Rose, how that kind of metaphor would sort of play out, but. So we're all talking about that, I think, about yeah. tradition, the thread that connects us to the past, to our ancestors, who, those who taught us, to those who we teach, um, to the future, to our children, I mean. And then the thread through the South that you write about and that I write about as well. Um, yeah. And Natalie writes about as well. I mean, there's something so, um, the violence and the redemption, the beauty and the suffering of the South. You know, it's very particular kind of suffering and beauty. It is. Yeah. Yeah, which there, by the way, to everybody who's on Facebook, thank you for being here. And feel free to put questions if you have them for Natalie or Rose in the comments. Um, we've got one that I think is on this point. I, I wanted to in, in, throw it in now because it seems relevant to this subject. Uh, the questioner asks, how does the thread relate to what is happening in the country right now? How do you feel the shift in your connection to your artistic purposes? Mm. Well, since you two are in the South right now, I'd love to hear what you said first before I spout off about anything. I mean, I have, you know, obviously I have lots of thoughts about that, but I mean, this is not a new question that we've been answering i'm very grateful that it's something that's come up and everybody's thinking about it right now but you know i've been working in cotton in alabama for 20 years and you can't work cotton here and not think about the history that comes behind it so you know we started a um, an organization sort of years ago that got an official you know 501c3 status this year called project threadways and um, I think that thread you know has to go all the way back to the Indians who you know originally lived here and were um, you know it is believed worked with cotton grew cotton had cotton made their clothes so there is this very I think people forget there is this very, very long timeline of cotton and making and material culture that goes all through our history. And um, as Rose said, there's been a lot of suffering around that, a lot of beauty around it, a lot of violence, um, you know, so um, it's, it's good that it's coming out in my opinion. Oh my Finally, we can have some conversations about it and try to figure it out. I mean, I think this thing where, you know, when we started Project Threadways, it was like, we don't have any answers and we're going to make horrible mistakes. And, um, you know, but to not have the conversation is much worse than to have the conversation and make mistakes at it. So... I think it's a great time where we just feel like, okay, we don't, you know, we don't have to hide it because we don't understand it. We don't have to, you know, look away because we don't know what to say. We just, um, you know, unflinchingly and humbly try to have these conversations now around all those threads. Can um, I ask you, Natalie, about how this relates to your, um, your mission statement at, and Alabama Channon is to preserve traditions of community design, producing and living arts by examining work and life through the act of storytelling, photography, education, and making. So what you do is not just making clothes. It's, it's a much bigger, um, almost like a cultural intervention. You're thinking about... <laughs> Thinking about like, it feels like that. <laughs> I mean that in a positive way. No, um, I love it. I've never heard it that way. But I, I just made, I just made it 
it up. But, <laughs> um, but you're you're getting us to think about like these very basic activities that we literally, you know, we the fruits of which we literally wear on our backs, and how they're related to this thread again that takes us back all the way, and um, that connection between that part of the storytelling part is really a big part of what you do. And yeah, it, and, it really has evolved that way. And I, you know, I don't. I always look back and say, I'm, you know, it seems like I'm really smart, but I just kind of stumbled onto this, you know, I, in so many different ways and in so many converging ways. Um, you know, I came back at a time where NAFTA had been signed. And so I came back to my hometown in 2000. And, you know, there were a few small textile companies left, but for the most part, NAFTA had pretty much decimated the industry all across. So, you know, our little community is just reflective of what happened all across the South and, you know, across the U.S. Um, in a broader sense. And, you know, there were just so many people's stories connected to that. And so people who came to work for me would tell stories of being in the factories and, you know, this, the factory that we were, that we are in now that we call the factory was, you know, pretty much left empty and there were buildings and building, you know, it's huge. It's about 140,000 square foot. And there were buildings like this all through our community, you know, because it was known as, um, from the 80s up until NAFTA was signed as the t-shirt capital of the world. So, um, you know, so there's that, there's that story and that thread and so many people's families and lives wrapped up in it. You know, um, most of the, one of the ladies that worked with us for many years always said, you know, these people, speaking of the factory workers that were around her, these people were my family. We raised our kids together. We had lunch together. We broke bread together. They, I mean, she left, um, she graduated from high school on a Saturday and went to work in that factory on Monday morning, right? and her sister and her mama worked there. And so it was just culturally was so deep. And so, and I always say that the people who worked in those factories really saw themselves as artisans, you know? And then we went through this kind of cultural shift where we, instead of being a country or a nation of makers, we kind of devalued this sort of handwork. And um, I think, you know, our, the people of our community here, they, they felt and still, still feel today, the people who work at the factory, like we're doing something that's worthy and that we're proud of. And, and so we kind of stripped a nation of this um, ability to feel worthy and proud of this act of making something, whether it's making steel or textiles or something else. And so, um, sorry, this is a very long answer, but when I came home and started hearing these stories, it felt like something that needed to be documented because it was dying. It was a culture, this culture of making was dying out in the South. And so we started collecting stories and documenting them. So. And I'm intrigued by how this relates to your, this kind of, almost like oral history project, um, relates to your zero waste philosophy of <laughs> kind of environmental practices. Because it seems like you know, this, is, this is the way I read that was the, uh, this storytelling, this documenting, this preserving um, the dignity of this form of work through these stories is a is a manifestation of a zero waste policy or zero waste philosophy towards memory and you know what we're talking about in terms of the american talent for amnesia and the southern 
version of that. Um, but it's a fairly universal quality in, in American culture that we have redacted out versions of or stories from history that don't serve the, the narrative of um, white America, basically. So it is it fair to say that that kind of zero waste philosophy applies also to memory, that there should be nothing we leave out or regard from the outset as disposable. I mean, I agree completely, you know. I, I mean, it did. It has occurred to me over the years, you know, we talk about sustainability and that has its own, you know, everybody has a narrative around it and it can be, a, you know, a PR thing or it can be um, what I think, you know, sustainability for human really is just food, clothing, shelter, right? We need to eat, we need to be sheltered and we wear clothing. Um, you know, to protect us from the elements, right? So if you don't have clothes to wear in the winter, then you, um, you know, you risk hypothermia or, um, you know, injury. And so, um, you know, it occurred to me that we, we talk about these things all the time, but we don't often talk about cultural sustainability and, um, you know, that retaining culture and retaining knowledge is something really important for the future of humanity, right? And so preserving these stories, I think, is is part of that in the broader sense. Yeah. So, Rose, you, you recently, along this kind of line, you recently curated a show for Carnegie Hall mm. um, that mm. was a kind of online concert um, that you titled Songs of Protest and Memory. Yeah, well, I'm going to just distill this so that somebody else can ask a question. But everything you've said, I keep thinking now and about memory. I mean, last year, uh, I had went to Birmingham and Natalie and our friend Scott Peacock met me and John for my birthday dinner. And the next day, John and I went down to uh, Montgomery to the, what they're calling the lynching memorial, the Memorial for Peace and Justice. And I don't know why I felt so compelled to do it, but it was about that, about um, what was in my, own past, my grandfather as a cotton farmer who had deep racist tendencies, and my father cut that thread of racism. And I was thinking about in my generation, it's not enough to just cut it. It's an, you have to go on to reparation and reconciliation, not just culturally, but in myself. Mm -hmm. And that's been so present in my mind for the last year and now even more so with um, the protests, which is why I um, did this show in part. Uh, it was a time for protest songs and to remember that that's part of our cultural heritage too. I mean, this thing about telling musicians to shut up and sing hmm. is insane because it's, it's part of our American tradition back to Woody Guthrie and before, protest songs. And mm -hmm. they're essential because whatever is happening in society, in the cultural moment, there is music for it. And a lot of times that's the only way we make sense of what's going on is through art and music, some mm -hmm. kind of beauty and metaphor and something that moves us deeply to help us think about something in a different way. It's absolutely essential. And, you know, my son educate me all the time about what the future looks like for reconciliation and reparation. It's not enough just to say you're not 
racist. You have to be actively anti-racist hmm. and on and on and on. But you have, um, in that show, in that, um, show that you put together, you had a kind of can canon, for lack of a better word, of American protest music. You had yeah. Sam Cooke um, and another, of, I'm forgetting now, who, who else is on the repertoire? Well, Nina Simone and, Nina and Simone. Tudor, Elvis Costello. Um, yeah, there was everything for tolerance and beauty and acceptance, Liz Wright, Liz to Wright. real anger of uh, Ry Cooter and to the intensity of saying it's time for a revolution of Nina Simone. And then for the, the longing of uh, the Sam Cooke song that Brandy Carlisle and uh, Gary Davis Jr. did. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, that, that's the spectrum of protest, right? And I thought it had to be, it had to all be touched. But it also goes back to this idea of tradition. Like you've got these songs that are kind of like part of the songbook, but you have yeah. new generation of artists who are doing this in their own way. And it's, it's, it's every time it's new and it's, um, it's somehow different and it reveals to us something that maybe we didn't hear the first in the first well and, and young people are new <laughs> they're yeah. new in the world you know they they didn't hear a change is going to come first time around and it means something slightly different to them do you have there songs in your own uh repertoire your own kind of corpus that you're hearing differently now Oh, that happens to me all the time. Yeah. I mean, even from night to night performing one of my own songs, I'll hear something different in it the next night. And a lot of times it's because of the energy that the audience really deeply sad to me. And the next night there's humor and, mm. you know, lightness of spirit. You know, it's what you bring in the moment. How has that been to miss that, you know, that experience? Well, I wrote an article about it for The Atlantic that was out a few weeks ago. And I, I, I have been doing really well in my house being home because I, I long for that when I'm on the road. But I did start thinking a lot about missing that connection with the audience. It's, that article was great. Mm -hmm. Deep connection. I, I, I the, the the show made me think of where we're talking about this idea of kind of a tradition as a living organism and um, and how you know a different a new performance brings something um, either to it and also out of that original material. Mm -hmm. um, I know that will the circle be unbroken is probably like you know so much a part of your um sort of genetic soundscape yeah um but and it's such a class it's such a again such a like canonical work there's a there's a recording of it um to me this is like the most american thing ever in the best sense there's a version of it that the neville brothers recorded and it's uh it, the album was produced by daniel lanois so it has this kind of atmospheric very you know signature kind of uh, mood to it and but it's a song that kind of comes out of one tradition one yeah. american tradition and here is being performed and reimagined by a group that comes out of, of a com completely different tradition and it has like, there's such power in that. Um, this, and sometimes, you know, there are canonical texts that can't be embraced by um, other, sure. other communities. Um, yeah. In this well, case, 
Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Well, I, I think that there are, I mean, there are a few uh, traditions that are absolutely pure and don't mix. You know, bluegrass comes to mind. Yeah. Like that is so rooted in a particular style, a particular tradition, and a particular skill set that you can't, I don't know how well it marries, you know, that it could vary with the blues or with uh, uh, other traditions. But uh, that song, uh, you know, Americans own that song. All Americans own that song. Mm. Remember when we did that makeshift um, event in New York City and you came up with a song and we left some words out of it and the audience filled it in. Oh God, I and forgot about that. We created a song and then we all sang it together. Remember how beautiful I, oh, that was? I forgot was? about that. Did anyone film that? <laughs> I don't know, I'm gonna have to uh, look back and see, but it was this um, beautiful moment of connection, a song like a, a very historical song that became something new and different just with a community that was together really for a couple of hours, mm -hmm. right? Yes, very That's crazy. crazy. Wonderful we how. But there is this way that we all have to own that um, that history, right? Yeah. So there are these things, like you say, that come along through history that we bring along with us. But we, we as a culture in our time, need to own it, too, right? Which is kind of what I'm doing with my work, you know? These are very traditional techniques, but owning it in this moment. Right. Taking it for while trying to understand the past. Um, you getting questions? Pete? I've got a tough one here. This is this is a <laughs> this is a good one. It's long, but it and it's it's packed. But I think this is a really important one. So, my cousin-in-law. I guess can you have a cousin-in-law? He's my cousin. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Um, so. I would, he want, the Dave asks about the concept of cultural appropriation. He says, mm -hmm. I have really struggled with the idea because it seems to me that one of the paths to equitable unity entails a convergence of cultural elements. How do traditions like the blues and even some of the maker's work that takes place in the South and elsewhere persist and unite without crossing the line of cultural appropriation? Wow. Well, I don't sing Motown. <laughs> I'm not going to appropriate that because yeah. I know it's outside of my realm and it would be false. And, you know, I mean, that's an example. Um, mm. I, but the way I would say that is that I have, I know that almost that everything I do, I owe to either Delta blues musicians, I owe to black musicians, or I owe to Appalachia, mm -hmm. basically, right? And I'm uh, well aware of that, that I get a lot of attention that these elderly black musicians in the Delta don't get, who many of whom I have met mm -hmm. and I'm so humbled by, and I honor them. Um, maybe maybe not appropriating has to do with honor and respect and acknowledgement and and movement i think too right so you you know it's like a poem we all poets use the same words but they're put together in a way that makes it unique to a particular poet so it's whether you're taking something and copying it, or you're taking something and truly understanding it, or doing everything in your power to understand it, and moving it forward in a way, or in new combinations. I would agree with that. I mean, basically, for a musician and a writer, there are five stories and 12 notes. They've all been written. Yeah. 
So the, what Natalie just said about moving it forward. I mean, it's the same is true with sewing. You know, there's essentially five different embroidery stitches and everything else is a, a variation on that. And yeah. You keep making because you have to, you know, there's something inside of you that makes you keep writing or keep making music or keep making clothing. Some story you have to tell. And um, I, I do think that thing that you said about honoring, or it, it's also like an understanding, right? So it's one thing to not understand something and take an image and just place it in. It's another thing to really understand, to do the research, to um, delve deeply into the history and the culture of that, and then try to translate that into what you're doing at this moment. I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did we answer his question? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, let's see what Dave says. Um, I that find this response good. to be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> lots more to say and ponder, but this is good. So I think, yeah, there's, you know, like, as with stitches and music, you know, there are a finite number of, of, notes within an octave and and I guess a finite number of notes within the audible range of of sound but within that finite range there's a you know a potentially infinite set of combinations that one could um one could create out of those and those the possibilities from that limited set are virtually um unending just like conversations about this like there's never a final, every answer has to be sort of provisional for a time being until we kind of understand more and if we had all, all day to talk about it. We have about 60 minutes to talk today and it's been 58, which has gone so oh, fast. Wow. <laughs> and um, I have more questions and more thoughts now than I did when I started this an hour ago, which is, which I, I knew it was going to happen because um, both of you inspire me so much and, and I have learned so much about so many things from both of you and you. continue to inspire and um, show all of us what can be done with these finite limited set of resources or limited set of talents that each of us has. There's so much to take courage from in what you've just, both of you has, has both of you have articulated today. Um, this way of kind of looking back is a way of, of, of leading us forward. You know, Natalie, in your case, you, you, you've literally given us the tools to practice this. In the back of the geometry of hand sewing, there are actually little templates and plastic ones where you can do these stitches yourself. And, you know, in Rose, in your work, you are pushing us forward in, imaginatively, I think, with, with um, understanding through music what it is that we have inherited um, as, a, as a musical family, if that makes sense. I know there are lots of musical families. Um, mm. But what are some of the possibilities that we have within, we have already that we can resource in new ways and in ways that we, we haven't even imagined yet. So I wish I had more than an hour with you both. <laughs> um, and I hope that somewhere down the road, um, we will. Natalie, I'm supposed to be seeing you in October, hoping that still I know. I know. happens. Maybe we'll we just plan to carry on and we'll just respond to what's happening in the world as it comes, right? Roll with it, as my mother says. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna put for everybody who's still out there on Facebook, uh, some links where you can follow uh, Natalie and Roseanne on various social media and A Deeper South as well. 
And I hope this is the first of many more conversations. Oh, your, your newsletter is so great. It's oh, really lovely. Thank you. Oh yeah, we should Very say inspiring. everybody should follow a new Decameron too, Pete. Yes. Yes, yeah. a new Decameron. Uh, yeah. Little plug for a new Decameron, which which started through Roseanne's help uh, a few months ago when quarantine was the thing. Um, so we started a collaborative project that was uh, hopefully we're going to get to a hundred um, stories and collections of poems from a wide range of people. It was inspired by Boccaccio's Decameron which was written in the 14th century uh, it, around very similar circumstances. It's a uh, collection of a hundred stories that um, told by 10 Florentines who escaped the plague in Florence and for the country where they, they survive by telling one another stories. And I think, you know, that's, that's ongoing. I don't know how long the quarantine will last, but a new Decameron I think is gonna be going for a while. So uh, please check that out too. And I think, you know, what we're talking about here is related storytelling, making music, sewing, it's a form of survival, but it's bigger than that too. There's, there's joy and hope and courage and sadness and, and, and grief and all the rest to be found in those activities together. Thank you all for being here. It's so Thank great you. to see you and stay tuned. Well, mm-hmm. <laughs>